Amy and I had reached a crossroads. We'd lingered in New England after college for the better part of a decade and grown roots in her family's hometown. Living only a few blocks from her childhood home and living in an apartment her family had passed down for multiple generations. But her folks had sold their house, listed our apartment, and set off on a new chapter in North Carolina. Having spent so long near her family, we decided to relocate closer to mine for a while, under the wide open skies of Montana. The jump in cost of living would be significant, and we had very little to show for our life of playing in the outdoors. Knowing we couldn't buy property and wouldn't last long in a renter's market, we decided to take the plunge on a bucket list goal of ours and move full time into our trusty, rusty, and dusty steed, Bullwinkle. For those of you who aren't familiar with the pedigree of our 1985 Volkswagen Vanagon, Westphalia, er, Weekender edition, here's a little history. What's the biggest difference between the Volkswagen Vanagon and those new minivans? Exciting new vehicle for the 1980s, the new Volkswagen Vanagon. In 1950, Volkswagen introduced its transporter line, an iconic and compact utility vehicle often referred to as a micro bus. Over the next several decades, this lovable bread box would win popularity amongst rebellious Western youth culture, becoming a mainstay of the hippie movement, cementing itself in the Road Trip Hall of Fame for a handful of obvious reasons, like its affordability, ease of repair, as well as general aesthetic and ergonomics. Nothing said freedom quite like the Volkswagen bus. Though the transporter line took many forms, none was more popular than the camper model, the Westphalia, or as it's been affectionately nicknamed, the Westie. Subsequent models received an 80s makeover and rebranding, and the T3 Vanagon was born. Volkswagen does it again. Though Volkswagen discontinued the T3 in 1991, its popularity remained strong amongst the camping community, and despite its obvious shortcomings, is still one of the most coveted recreational vehicles ever made. Now some of you might be thinking, I'm a pretty lucky guy to have convinced my wife to let me buy a van again. But the truth is, it wasn't my idea at all. It was actually my wife's. We should buy a van. I suppose at this point I should mention what we do, and why owning a questionably reliable 35-year-old adventure mobile is up our alley. We're documentarians. Be it in film, photos, writing, or painting, we document the natural world around us because we believe that within nature lies the building blocks for human health and happiness. We're living in an age dubbed by many as the Anthropocene, or in other words, an era in which the greatest impact on the world's geology, climate, and ecosystems is caused by humans. Population explosions mean exponential loss in habitat, and with it, a sixth mass extinction event, the first one human beings have been around to witness. For those of us who spend our lives living closely with the natural world, each day seems to bring a greater sense of urgency, not only to save and restore, but even to catalog and understand what we have before it's lost. In 2015, Trout Unlimited released a sweeping report called State of the Trout, chronicling not only the massive decline in North America's native salmonids to date, 
noting that 92% of native trout are under some degree of threat, but also projecting losses of up to 60% of currently suitable habitat by 2080 if current climate trends continue. My decision to illustrate as many native and rare trout as possible came from both a place of personal desire to see and experience these fish before they're gone, but also a sense of duty that if some of the rare species may actually be on their way out, I have the ability to add to our collective catalog of documentation and hopefully inspire others to garner interest and take action to protect them. What started as a quest to sample and illustrate rare trout quickly became a journey of exploration that pushed both Amy and my boundaries of understanding. And though this journey began in an age before the global pandemic, our experiences now seem more poignant than ever, as millions of Americans as well as citizens around the globe are stuck in their homes, disconnected from the momentum of business as usual. With national parks and natural spaces overflowing with an unprecedented number of people rediscovering the outside world, the message of nature's importance, as well as its fragility, may never have been more important. So in the fall of 2019, we set off on a journey that would change us. A journey to document, discover, and explore the world in our own backyard. To speak with friends, experts, and strangers and to ask questions that were oftentimes uncomfortable in hopes of gaining a better understanding of the world around us and the things we've taken for granted. This is For Wild Sake, The Rare Trout Chronicles. Please listen carefully. Okay, so the van wasn't quite ready yet. We'd spent most of the winter chipping away at the revolving door of maintenance projects. Some small and some large. One motor, two transmissions, and a heap of other doodads later, and we had ourselves an almost road-ready mobile home. But despite all our efforts, the van just wouldn't run how we wanted it to. So after a month of ripping our hair out, we decided to leave him in the very capable hands of a seasoned Volkswagen mechanic. Your destination is on the left. Spoiler alert, it took all of 20 minutes to fix the problem. It was totally our fault to begin with. So for all you Westie owners out there, before you go around refreshing your electrical connections, make sure you really understand how a coaxial cable works. The van was finally running properly but the delays had caused us to fall way behind on the rest of our prep. We've learned the hard way on countless occasions that the world doesn't wait for your car troubles, and the first species on our list came with a time crunch as the fishing season neared its end. So we had to temporarily abandon Bullwinkle in favor of Amy's commuter and head up to Maine without him.
we were on our way to the North Woods, a place that by now we were quite familiar with, but in search of a fish we only knew from stories, the blueback trout. There we'd meet with our friend Daryl Hartman, a writer who'd been assigned a story on the bluebacks, which we were contracted to photograph for a local Maine magazine. The North Woods is an imposing three and a half million acre forested landmass comprising the upper third of the state of Maine. It has no towns, no paved roads, and is controlled by a somewhat complex matrix of private and industrial interests that allow the public a place to recreate while still providing a sustainable harvest for Maine's renowned timber industry. It's what many would consider a working forest, providing the lion's share of Maine's half a million acres of annual timber. Home to the 100 mile wilderness, the final and most grueling stretch of the Appalachian Trail, the world famous Allagash Wilderness Waterway, and countless miles of rugged and beautiful country popularized most famously by the writings of Henry David Thoreau, the North Woods is a rarity. In a sea of crowded and industrialized East Coast states, its habitat has remained relatively undisturbed and interconnected, partly because of its value to the local people and partly because of its harsh and unforgiving landscape. Access to the North Woods is granted to the public for a fee, but once beyond the gates, you're on your own. You have Massachusetts points? Yes. Drop that paper off on your way home, or if you want to keep it for a receipt, you tell whoever's here. Okay. She likes to keep it. The magazine had put us up at Bradford Camps, one of the area's oldest continuously running sporting camps, located a short floatplane ride from one of the last waters to sustain a population of bluebacks, Big Reed Pond. After 50 miles of dirt, we are greeted by the camp's fifth and current owners, Igor and Karen Sikorsky. <laughs> if that name sounds familiar, that's because it probably should. Igor's grandfather and namesake is one of the most important figures in modern aviation history. 
the father of the helicopter, the name Sikorsky has dominated the world's skies, both military and civilian, for nearly a century. It seemed insane that we'd be getting flown around in a single-engine aircraft in search of a rare char by a direct descendant of Sikorsky, yet here we were. We shared something in common with Igor and Karen. We'd all made a decision to abandon the paths we'd been on in favor of a more deliberate life, guided by a passion for nature and the outdoors. I'm driving down the highway. It's something like July. My birthday's in September, and I'm 29 years old. And I have this epiphany. Oh my God, I'm going to turn 30, and I don't know how to fly an airplane. The real genesis of owning a sporting camp for me was the fact that I lived and worked summers at another sporting camp in Maine, and it just got stuck into my soul. Karen and I had a short decade of normal type careers, building trades and clothing industry, but we searched for and found the Bradford camps, and it uh, been a good decision for us. I am the grandson of Igor Sikorsky. He built the world's first enclosed cockpit, the world's first multi-engined aircraft. He built the largest ocean-going airplanes for a number of years. All of Pan Am's early aircraft were Sikorsky's. And on top of all those achievements, at 50 years old, he decided to solve the helicopter problem. He was not driven by a financial need. He was driven by a personal desire to succeed in this career that got a hold of his soul at an early age. Although I have run off from Connecticut to become myself, I also have found myself as the grandson of Igor Sikorsky, and I'm honored to be that person. Pilots are pilots because they have to be a pilot. There is something in there that draws you to want to know that feeling and learn it and understand the intricacies of the whole thing. I am connecting or channeling my grandfather when I am flying up here. Once we settled in, we got right to the business at hand, finding the bluebacks. But before proceeding, we should probably clarify a few things about that name. Blueback trout aren't actually trout, and their backs aren't particularly blue either. They're a species of char, Arctic char to be specific, a fish generally associated with northern latitudes, even holding the title for the northernmost freshwater fish in existence. They're incredibly widespread in many Arctic and subarctic watersheds, persisting in North America, Europe, Siberia, and Greenland, and have such a wide variation in both genetic makeup and physical appearance that scientists and anglers alike have spent centuries arguing over what exactly constitutes the species. Relics of the last ice age, Maine's Arctic char are the southernmost population of their kind. As the glaciers retreated, distant, sea-run relatives of the bluebacks made a journey across the Atlantic to North America, swimming up rivers and becoming trapped and isolated in lakes and ponds. Once believed to be several different species, these landlocked Arctic char have been called by many names, but we now know that the blueback trout of Rangeley, Sunapee, Golden, or White Trout of Lake Sunapee, and the Red Trout of Quebec are in fact all the same species, Salvolinus alpinus aquasa. Once relatively abundant in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, all extant strains of the fish have dwindled to only 12 ponds, all located within northern Maine. 
The Rangeley Lakes region had the largest concentration, which famously served as the primary forage fish for its leviathan brook trout, some of the largest in the world. But by the turn of the 20th century, the bluebacks were extinct, and the giant brookies soon followed. The second largest population, in Lake Sunapee, suffered a similar fate. The culprit of their demise? As is the case with most of our native salmonids, the introduction of non-native fish had taken its toll on the delicately adapted ecosystems. A number of factors like Rangeley's infamous market fishery and human development on Lake Sunapee surely contributed, but the introduction of rainbow smelt, landlocked Atlantic salmon, and lake trout, respectively, was a blow the fish simply couldn't recover from. Mankind's attempt to improve on nature had proven disastrous. The greatest threat right now is introduction of invasives because it's so irreversible. Whereas pollution or habitat degradation or even overfishing, those are correctable and they're reversible. Even though, you know, if you destroy the habitat, it, do, it could take a long time to recover. But introducing a non-native fish is something that we don't have the tools to deal with. In most cases, non-native trout and char are problematic because they interbreed with native fish, diluting genetic diversity and often causing them to disappear completely. It's an issue we'll tackle frequently in this series because most of the time, the reason these non-native fish exist where they do today is to meet angler demand, oftentimes inadvertently causing the resource anglers claim to love the most the greatest harm. The angler, we might not be the ones doing the stocking, but we're certainly the ones enabling the stocking. It's a tough one. I mean, I'd love to sit here and say that we're the answer, but right now, you know, we're probably more of the problem than the solution. When we're using non-native fish as, as bait, we're putting bass where they don't belong, pike where they don't belong, muskies where they don't belong. And when supposed conservation groups are actively stocking water, which is not at all uncommon, we are part of the problem there. Uh, we were also the ones responsible for the exploitation that leads to calls for more stocking. made it to Big Reed Pond, but there was a question looming on everyone's minds. Would we find the elusive bluebacks, or would they remain hidden in the depths, forcing us to return empty-handed and try again the following year? They're really hard to catch. You can't just go there and catch fish, because people come for miles around for three days and they don't catch one. 
on the next episode of For Wild Sake. The blueback trout that are in the pond nosedive to near zero. We were really close to losing that population. In 2010, the pond was reclaimed. It's a success story.